Venezuela's prosecutor's office summons Juan Guaido for his links to an attempted coup. Cuba identifies 16 new confirmed coronavirus cases. And the Ukrainian parliament lifts a ban on the sale of farmland paving the way for the country to secure an $8 billion IMF loan. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South and I'm Camila Escalante. Venezuelan Attorney General Tarek William Saab announced that Juan Guaido has been summoned to testify in the investigation of Cliver Alcala Cordones, who was implicated in a recent plot which, as Alcala confessed, sought to carry out a magnicide and coup against Venezuelan government officials. National prosecutors at the headquarters of the public ministry on Thursday, April 2nd at 9 a.m. on the seizure of what, prosecutor re what the prosecutor referred to as a war arsenal in Colombia. Cliver Alcala, an associate of Juan Guaido's opposition sector, named Guaido as one of the intellectual authors of the plot in a four-part video posted to his Twitter account. Alcala Cordones and Antonio Jose Sequeira Torres, who served as the main leaders of a group of about 90 mercenaries, previously trained in camps in Colombia and have been charged. Those charges are crimes of treason against the homeland, illicit trafficking of weapons, terrorism, attempted assassination, and association to commit crimes. The Attorney General also posed a rhetorical question, how is it that Cleaver Alcala had confessed to the crime of arms trafficking while in Barranquilla, yet no Colombian authority arrested him. This arsenal was to be transferred illegally into our country, to then be utilized against the authorities of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela by assault groups trained prior in the arrested him. This arsenal was to be transferred illegally into our country, to then be utilized against the authorities of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela by assault groups trained prior in the neighboring country of Colombia, obviously with the consent of President Duque and of the Colombian government. From Colombia, the citizen Cliver Alcalá Cordones of Venezuela publicly confessed his participation in these acts and said that the attempt to move these weapons to Venezuela to arm terrorist groups had been carried out by direct instructions of Mr. Juan Guaidó. Additionally, Alcalá said that the agreement for the purchase of these weapons was signed by JJ Rendon and Juan Guaidó, among others, and which had the objective of, he himself said it, eliminating, in one word, surgically, previously identified objectives, to say it colloquially, to assassinate, kill the highest authorities of the Venezuelan state. President Nicolas Maduro provided an update on the state of affairs in Venezuela late Monday. He was at the Miraflores Palace to welcome the new Russian ambassador and spoke about the deepening of the Venezuela-Russian alliance and the support provided by President Putin as the Federation steps in to provide support to the Bolivarian nation. Today, I have come to Miraflores to receive the diplomatic credentials of the new ambassador of the Russian Federation, Sergei. He has told me to call him Sergio. He's a great diplomat and a great man who has delivered to me a message direct from the President Putin of all of the solidarity of Russia with Venezuela and all of the Bolivarian people, all of the support of Russia, the ratification of the alliance and deep friendship between Russia and Venezuela. It is an alliance and friendship which is indestructible. The first plane from Russia arrived about a week ago. We have established an air bridge of support between Russia and Venezuela, and support from Russia will continue to arrive in the coming days. So we've been discussing all of the geopolitics. I brought up the necessary of retaking the dialogue surrounding OPEC Plus in order to advance objective agreements, which can be completed for the cooperation for the gradual progressive recovery but which is sustained by the oil market and by the price of oil.
Cuban health authorities have identified 16 positive cases at the close of Monday. The total now stands at 186. Of the 16 new cases, 14 are Cuban and the other two are foreigners. Six of those Cubans had traveled to United States, Spain, Canada and France, and the others were contacts of other confirmed cases. Since March 21st, 24th, all people arriving in the country have been admitted for 14 days of surveillance and are then referred to hospitals and isolation centers if and when they present respiratory symptoms. St. Lucian authorities are reporting new coronavirus cases today, bringing the new total to 13. None of the new cases have traveled recently. On the evening of Monday, March 30th, the laboratory director at the Ezra Long Lab diagnosed an additional four cases of COVID-19, bringing the total confirmed cases in St. Lucia to 13. The first case is a 37-year-old female with no travel history, but was in contact with someone within the tourism industry. She presented to our healthcare facility on March 23rd. The second case is a 34-year-old female with no travel history, no known contact with someone with significant travel history, and presented to our healthcare facility on March 24th. The third case is a 54-year-old female with no travel history as well and came into the healthcare facility on March 24th. The fourth case is a 40-year-old male with no history of travel but contact with persons with recent travel into St. Lucia. He came into our healthcare facility on March 25th. Barbados is now up to 34 confirmed coronavirus cases. The government is warning that non-compliance with the measures will lead to an extension of the restrictions. Overnight, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, through its public health laboratory, conducted 22 COVID tests, of which one was a positive test, bringing the numbers of confirmed cases in Barbados to 34. The number of cases that we have recorded so far have resulted from over 250 tests that we have been able to conduct. If we do not adhere to the basic advice of restricting your movement only to those uh, occasions where it is ultimately necessary for, or absolutely necessary for you to leave your homes, then we will face a situation where the advice from the chief medical officer and myself will be that those restrictions should be extended. Prime Minister Dr. Timothy Harris of St. Kitts and Nevis has announced a total lockdown, which will initially last for a period of days, beginning at 6 a.m. on Friday. This is not a time for reckless behavior. Sober, responsible behavior is essential. The Cabinet of Ministers has determined that, after consultation with the Police High Command, the National COVID-19 Working Group, the Chief Medical Officer, and the Medical Chief of Staff of the JNF General Hospital, that there be a 24-hour curfew, a total lockdown, from 7 p.m. Tuesday, 31st March, to 6 a.m. Friday, 3rd April, in the first instance. It means that the current regulations will be repealed and new regulations made in which no one except the security forces and other security personnel, the healthcare officers, technical emergency officers of utilities, including telecoms and media personnel will be allowed out of their residences. We'll take a short break now. Join us again in a minute. The life is full of moments. Moments of fight. Moments of hope. Moments that present. 
moments that you can live in. The Resort Documentaries Sundays Only on the Resort Welcome back. Bolivia's de facto government has bowed to some citizen pressure and announced that families will be receiving some cash stipends in two installations beginning this Friday. Our correspondent, Freddy Morales, has the details. In the city of Riberalta, in the department of Benin, residents have defied quarantine measures and took to the streets to demand the free provision of food, which the government had previously promised. Protesting residents also called on the government to implement public health security measures to stop the arrival of people and vehicles in the city, as the Benin department remains the only part of Bolivia where no cases of COVID-19 have been reported so far. The government promised two weeks ago to give families an estipend of about $70 after each elementary student, and also promised a week ago to give free food packages worth some $50 to about 1.5 million families. However, to this date, the government hasn't fulfilled neither of its promises. Mexico has declared a national health emergency as the country registers over 1,000 COVID-19 cases and at least 28 deaths. Mexico has determined the relevance of declaring the disease epidemic caused by the COVID-19 virus a health emergency due to force majeure. Peru has extended the mandatory curfew in the southern and central parts of the country in an effort to stop the spread of COVID-19, which has infected 950 people and killed 24 others. During the extension of the state of national emergency that starts tomorrow, mandatory social immobilization for everyone in their homes from 18 hours, 6 p.m. until 5 hours the next day on a national level. The province of Guayas in, in Ecuador has been, has been the worst hit by the COVID-19 pandemic in the country, with well over 1,000 confirmed cases. Locals say that the government has been lacking, to say the least, as many are dying in their homes, while authorities often take days to pick up the bodies. The province of Guayas, in Ecuador's coast, has reported over 1,300 cases of COVID-19. On top of this, endless complaints by citizens on social media denounce a poor response from the government. For their part, Authorities have tried to play down the issue by claiming that a disinformation campaign is trying to hurt the government. But the people of Guayaquil tell a different story. The health system in Guayaquil collapsed. The phone number implemented by the government to tend to possible cases is a complete failure. Taking the COVID-19 test is expensive. People are dying on the street. We are seeing videos of this every day. Mere blocks from my house, there are bodies on the streets waiting to be picked up by authorities. People on the street tell similar stories, and they don't know who can help them. There's even rumors that official figures of the pandemic are being reduced significantly. The bodies are not being tested for the virus. My brother died days ago, but we don't know if it was coronavirus, and we'll never know. He was diagnosed with dengue. He was obese and had diabetes. He was a high-risk case. We won't know the truth, and he won't be counted. We couldn't even have a funeral for him. Meanwhile, accusations of corruption in the purchase of emergency equipment have come to light. The agency in charge has announced those involved in the corruption will be fired, as authorities insist the government is carrying out all possible measures to contain the pandemic. 
We have increased the healthcare personnel in Guayaquil to take care of these type of emergencies using the appropriate equipment. People will be treated with dignity and respect during these times that we are living. The wave of complaints about the bodies littering the streets of Guayaquil led to President Lenin Moreno to announce the creation of a task force that will make sure the dead receive a proper burial. Kenyan police have allegedly shot a 13-year-old boy on his balcony during an operation to enforce a curfew which was imposed to curb the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. Residents of a Nairobi shanty town where the shooting took place said police started violently enforcing or violently forcing people into their homes around 7 p.m. on Monday. During the confrontation, the boy was standing on his home's balcony when a bullet hit him fatally in the abdomen. The police has launched a probe into the incident, but rights groups say that the police is known for often using excessive force and carrying out unlawful killings. Tunisians from low-income families have taken to the streets to demand that the financial aid pledged by the government amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Dozens of people gathered in front of the social welfare offices in Ariana province, despite daytime restrictions limiting movements to those of extreme necessity. The European Union pledged to grant about $275 million to Tunisia to help fight the novel coronavirus, which so far has infected 227 people and killed five others in the country. Uganda has a announced a set of measures including the closure of shops selling non-essential items to halt the spread of the coronavirus. Measure one is to prohibit all people to people movement by everybody, including those using their private vehicles, border borders, tukutukus, etc. The second category of concentrations are the shopping malls, arcades, hardware shops, which gather a lot of people to sell and buy non-food items. These are suspended for 14 days, starting with the 1st of April 2020. Like the farms, we like the factories to keep producing because that is the lifeblood of the country. However, the danger is in the, working, in the workers going home and coming back. It is that daily movement that must be frozen. Let the factory owners arrange for crucial employees to camp around the factory area for the 14 days. If they cannot do that, let them suspend production for 14 days. Now to South Africa, where in the city of Cape Town, hundreds of homeless people are, are staying in a shelter during the lockdown period, but where sanitary conditions are by no means ideal. In the shadow of Table Mountain in the city centre, hundreds of homeless people have been given temporary shelter for the three-week lockdown. While the city provided tents, mobile toilets and food, People are complaining that the situation is far from ideal. The food is fine to eat. The taste for the food is, is right, but it's too little. There's a lot of people who use medication. The food is not enough. Some people, they don't have blankets. There's no buckets to ask for the people. And the toilet is faulty. NGOs are also contributing by providing meals. This mother-to-be are grateful for the temporary safe space. Sometimes we complain about the soup that we get there. Like we get soup in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. But uh, I told them you don't have to, you mustn't complain because you have to say alhamdulillah every single day for what you get out here. Because there's people outside there that doesn't have it all. But some of the homeless fear that these shelters might become a breeding ground for COVID-19. 
and because of the number of people with underlying diseases. Many might die if they get infected. People that are sitting here, they are not sanitized. People who are sleeping in these tents, they don't have any gloves. I checked each and every tent here. It's about eight people in a tent. Last night, the South African President Cyril Ramaphosa outlined a plan to increase the testing and screening of people. In the coming days, government will be rolling out a screening, testing, tracing and medical management program on a huge scale. Around 10,000 field workers at the moment will be visiting homes in villages in towns and cities to screen residents for the coronavirus symptoms. Mobile technology will also be used to trace those who have been in contact with confirmed coronavirus cases. Johan Abrams for Telesur in Cape Town, South Africa. Sum up news updates from the UK and Europe when we come back. Join us again after this. Who's moving the chess game? What interests and motivate the actors behind each event? The board is deployed there. Critical move. Investigates every event from Monday to Friday. Only on the Zoom. government has introduced a set of new measures to mitigate the economic impact of the coronavirus crisis, including a monthly stipend of about $480 for all temporary workers who were fired due to the state of emergency. All evictions without alternative housing in vulnerable homes are suspended from today until six months after the end of the state of emergency. No one can be evicted from their home. All current rental contracts that are about to expire are automatically extended for six months. A measure that in practice means that no tenant in Spain with a current contract can have their rent raised during the next six months. During the period of the state of emergency, electricity, water and gas providers cannot suspend service to any citizen in their permanent homes. The British government is struggling to keep up with mass testing for COVID-19, but decided to grant a free one-year extension for migrant health care workers. Our contributor Owen Doherty in Leeds has the details. The number of people to have died over the past day after testing positive for the COVID-19 virus in British hospitals has risen by 381. That brings the total to 1,789. Now this represents a 27% jump, the biggest daily rise so far. Of the concerns regarding the government's response to the COVID-19 crisis, one of the most important is the lack of access to adequate COVID-19 testing. Now, the government has promised more tests, but it's done this for the past two weeks. And as of now, the government is struggling to carry out 10,000 tests per day. Now, to put that into context, Germany is conducting 500,000 tests every week. One big shift in the British government's policy is the announcement of a free one-year extension of the visas for migrant workers in the healthcare sector. Now, anti-migrant rhetoric is ubiquitous in British society, stretching to the upper echelons of government. But this could represent tacit recognition of the role that migrant workers play in keeping the National Health Service functioning. We thank Owen for that report. Qatar is giving $100 to Palestinians in Gaza, Gaza City amid the COVID-19 pandemic. 
despite calls to lift the blockade as the best way to allow the state to combat the virus. The United Nations has warned that a COVID-19 outbreak in Gaza could be disastrous given the rate of poverty and the compromised health system, health capacity in the Gaza Strip under Israeli blockade since 2007. There are 117 confirmed COVID-19 cases in the West Bank and Gaza. Let them leave the blockade and provide jobs, and we won't be needing this aid that they are providing to the people. Why would young people need $100? What they need is jobs. Russia will be introducing new coronavirus measures, including punishment for those who violate the quarantine. Under the new legislation, penalties for breaking an imposed lockdown have increased, including a prison term for up to seven years for those whose behavior results in the death of two or more people. Moscow has been on lockdown since Monday. Russia registered 500 confirmed cases of the new coronavirus on Tuesday, putting the country's total to over 2,300 cases. The Ukrainian parliament has voted to lift a ban on the sale of farmland, paving the way for the country to get an $8 billion, $8 billion worth of loan from the International Monetary Fund. The bill opens up the land market for Ukrainian citizens beginning on July 1, 2001 and for Ukrainian companies beginning, on, beginning in 2024. And Ukrainians will vote in a referendum on whether to allow foreigners to buy farmland. However, opposition lawmakers say that the bill will lead to big corporations pushing out independent farmers from the market. From everybody in this hall depends Ukraine's future. Will it be a country of independent people, rich and independent country, or will it be a Ukraine under external control? We call on you to stop and not to vote for selling Ukraine and not to sell Ukraine's land. The Hungarian parliament has passed a controversial law that gives the government of far-right prime minister sweeping powers with no time limit. With the ruling Fidesz party having majority in the parliament, the request for the power to rule by decree during the coronavirus crisis was easily accepted in the parliament. Opposition parties and human rights groups say that the government will put several extreme measures in the law, including reducing democratic control over those measures and threatening journalists with jail. We've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at tellusyourenglish.net. And join us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Camila Escalante. Thanks for watching.